Good afternoon to calling user with the number 4169 ending in 54. Can you unmute yourself and give us a mic check? Just hit star 66 to unmute. Good afternoon, welcome to the city's COVID-19 media briefing. We'll start with Mayor Tory first, thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, Team Toronto is getting as many people vaccinated as we can with the vaccine supply that we have. As of last night, more than 758,882 doses have been administered uh, in the city of Toronto. That's more than 122,000 doses since our update last Wednesday. Toronto Public Health confirms that more than 20% of our city population have started vaccination. That's one in five residents who have received their first dose. Appointments are available to residents 50 and older who live in 53 hotspot postal codes. And that is in addition to others who are 60 years of age and up anywhere in the city who are still able to book appointments at our city vaccine clinics. 74,185 people signed up for their shot over the weekend. Our nine city-run clinics are at 100% capacity this week, and this is good news. And it comes as we see the COVID-19 case numbers continue to rise. That is the bad news. The case counts we have seen over the last few days are extremely troubling, and Dr. Davila will discuss this in more detail. We all need to keep following the public health advice right now to stop the spread of the virus, to save lives, to get through this wave, and to protect our health care system. Within the past hour, we heard a significant announcement from the province concerning schools. As mayor, I support Premier Ford's decision, announced this afternoon, to move all schools to online learning after the April break. These decisions are never easy, and I'm sure this one was very difficult for the Premier and for his government, but we have to do everything we can to make sure that our children are safe, as we all have throughout this pandemic. The public health advice right now is very clear, and we're all committed to following it so as to save lives, protect the health care system, save health. The city will work with the province to continue to provide and support emergency child care options for the families of our frontline heroes. We continue to do everything we can as a city to support the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. We want people across the city to get vaccinated as soon as possible. We are focused on the COVID-19 hotspots and making sure that people are vaccinated in these areas. Public health officials have been absolutely clear that this postal code focus is the best way to get essential workers and their families protected as quickly as possible. As has been the case with other challenges, including testing, mental health, and food security, we know there are community groups on the ground in neighborhoods across the city who can help with the vaccination effort. Today, we are announcing that funding of $5.5 million is flowing through the community services sector to help us with COVID vaccine engagement in the community. The grants will fund engagement teams led by 155 community agencies in 140 different neighborhoods across the city with an obvious focus on areas hardest hit by COVID-19. Each of the 14 engagement teams have a lead agency and 10 or more community agencies that serve in all areas of the city. In short, in these targeted areas, their job is to help us get people vaccinated by doing whatever it takes to both eliminate reluctance and hesitation and to provide supports such that between the two, everyone is comfortable and supported getting a vaccination. The work of the agencies has already started. For example, the Ghanaian Canadian Association in North Etobicoke is holding well-attended COVID-related educational workshops conducted by community-based physicians and health professionals. And they are meant to address social and physical distancing, the efficacy of vaccines, and vaccine conspiracy misinformation. 
The Sunshine Center for Seniors in the city's downtown east shares COVID-19 health promotion messages to seniors through their virtual programs. They have created a vaccination support line to assist older adults with the vaccination booking process. These are just two examples of the hundreds of grassroots efforts that will help our residents to get vaccinated. The grants will allow engagement teams to recruit 280 resident ambassadors who are trusted community representatives with networks that reach every part of our city in many different languages. Targeted groups are many, and they include seniors, disability communities, and the South Asian community. Also part of this program is funding for groups which can help, can help us focus on black resilience and the particular circumstances of newcomer groups. We're working with community organizations that residents know and trust, and we will utilize those relationships to increase vaccine uptake. It is this kind of cooperation between the city and community partners that will have a lasting and positive impact on the health of our city and its residents. The grants are part of the city's community investment funding program and supports the community mobilization and engagement plan. I want to thank our Social Development, Finance and Administration Division for launching this important project and the community agencies that will help to bring it to life. This work will help us to get people vaccinated and that in turn will help us to bring this pandemic to an end. The full list of agencies involved will be posted online, but I do want to recognize the lead agencies today and those of you who live in these areas will recognize these as being agencies that you know well. Black Creek Humber Summit, the lead agency, LumaCare. Downtown East, the lead agency is the 519 Community Center. Downtown West, the lead agency is Scadding Court Community Center. In East York, Don Valley, there are two teams, the TNO, the Net Neighborhood Organization in Thorncliffe Park, and Access Alliance Multicultural Health and Community Services. In North Etobicoke, the Rexdale Community Health Center. In North Scarborough, Agent Court Community Services Association. In North York, the North York Community House. In South Etobicoke, the Lakeshore Area Multi-Service Project, Inc. And in South Scarborough, Scarborough Center for Healthy Communities, York West Pelham, the Syme Woolner Neighborhood and Family Center. So these are agencies that will be well known to people living in those neighborhoods and will do a good job of helping us to mine those relationships and to convince people and support people in getting vaccinated. The newcomer cluster engagement team is led by FCJ Refugee Center and Jane Finch Community and Family Center, while the Black Resilience Engagement Team is led by the Taibu Community Health Center. These vaccine engagement teams are a huge part of the extraordinary effort going in to the vaccination rollout and making sure that everyone across our city and especially in the communities hit hardest by this pandemic have the information they need in order to get their vaccination. This pandemic will only end when the majority of us are vaccinated. The funding we are flowing to community organizations will help immeasurably to make that possible. Like our overall pandemic management to date, these community engagement measures are meant to ensure that we focus on every single Torontonian in every single neighborhood, without exception. This initiative will quite properly place extra resources and a different approach in neighborhoods and communities in which such an extraordinary program is needed and justified. That is because of both the marginalized circumstances of many communities before the pandemic and because of the grossly disproportionate, disproportionate impact of the pandemic itself on those very same people, together with their underrepresentation to date in the ranks of those who have received a vaccination. In short, it is the right thing to do from every perspective. Finally, Ramadan begins tomorrow. I want to extend my warmest regards to our Muslim community and wish everyone a blessed and peaceful and safe and healthy Ramadan. Ramadan Mubarak to all celebrating Ramadan in our city. We've had a number of inquiries from mosques about the call to prayer. The noise bylaw provides standards for noise in Toronto and includes decibel limits and time restrictions for all kinds of amplified noise. But we recognize that there are gathering limits right now for religious services and one's spiritual, emotional and mental well-being is important during these difficult times. As was the case last year during Ramadan, mosques may broadcast calls to prayer during the month of Ramadan and the city will not request a noise exemption permit to be obtained. 
Noise complaints submitted 2311 will be handled by the noise team on a case-by-case -case basis, and the city will work with mosques in question to resolve any issues that arise. I want to thank residents for again celebrating Ramadan in a safe way this year in keeping with public health measures. I know it is a sacrifice like many are being asked to make and we appreciate your cooperation in that regard. I would now like to invite Chief Pegg to provide his update for today. Thank you, Mayor Tory. Good afternoon. Before I begin my formal remarks this afternoon, I'd like to acknowledge that this is National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. 24 hours a day and seven days per week, our 911 operators and our police, fire and paramedic services call takers and dispatchers are on the very front lines of emergency response. These dedicated people are the calm and professional voices that residents and visitors hear on the other end of the phone during their time of emergency. Likewise, it is this team of professionals who are such a vital link to both first responders and incident commanders every day. This is demanding, difficult, and very stressful work, and I both acknowledge and thank each and every member of our team for all they do in the name of public safety. As of 11 o'clock this morning, we successfully opened three additional city-operated COVID-19 vaccine clinics. Our newest clinics at Cloverdale Mall, North Toronto Memorial Community Centre and Carmine Stefano Community Centre are now in operation, delivering 2,680 doses of vaccine each day between the three of them. Only a few short weeks ago, on March 17, we opened the first three city-operated clinics, weeks ahead of the original target of April 1st. And now, our full network of nine clinics is running seven days per week. I am so proud and appreciative of our extraordinary teams who have worked day and night to make these clinics a reality. It requires a team of nearly 1,400 people to operate our network of clinics. And I want to thank each and every member of the team who continues to give so much. Beginning today, we are able to administer 56,322 doses of COVID-19 vaccine each week across the network of nine city-operated vaccine clinics. While this is a very significant number of people being vaccinated each week in our clinics, this is only a portion of what we are capable of delivering. We are intentionally scaling our clinic operations in order to protect vaccine allotment for our hospital and Ontario Health Team partners as well, such that their clinic operations are also able to continue to the largest extent possible. As we have from the outset, we are matching the number of available appointments each day with the number of doses of vaccine that are available. Assuming that vaccine availability increases in the weeks and months to come, as the, prov as the province forecasts that it will, we look forward to being able to administer more than twice the number of vaccines we are administering in our city-operated vaccine clinics at present. Demand for appointments in city-operated vaccine clinics continues to be very high. All nine of our city-operated clinics are fully booked all of this week, and many clinics are now fully booked into May, with bookings happening steadily each day. Between 8 o'clock this morning and 3 o'clock this afternoon, Another 17,640 first dose appointments have been booked in city operated vaccine clinics. If you are eligible to receive vaccine, I encourage you to book your appointment without delay. All nine of our clinics are now operating from 11 a.m. through 8 p.m., seven days per week. Our clinics continue to run smoothly with little to no wait for those who arrive at their scheduled appointment times. Most people are checked in, vaccinated and checked out in about 30 minutes. Our team of first responders and healthcare professionals are there to provide any assistance that may be required. You are encouraged to bring and wear your own mask throughout your time at the clinic. We are happy to supply a mask to anyone that requires one. We also have processes in place to assist any clients who are unable to wear a mask for medical reasons. 
The province of Ontario has extended vaccine eligibility for teachers who either live or work in designated hotspot neighbourhoods. The province of Ontario is working directly with the school boards in order to implement these changes and provide information on how eligible teachers can get vaccinated. As of 8 o'clock this morning, eligible education workers who received a letter from their school board are able to book their vaccine appointments by calling the provincial call centre at 1-888-999-6488. Likewise, the province of Ontario has also extended vaccine eligibility for all those 18 years of age or older, but only when attending a mobile or pop-up vaccine clinic in a designated hotspot neighbourhood. This eligibility does not extend to clinics booked through the provincial booking system, nor at any of the city-operated vaccine clinics at this time. Mobile and pop-up clinics are coordinated directly by the Ontario COVID-19 Health Care Leadership Table and are operated by our hospital and Ontario health team partners as vaccine availability permits. While we endeavour to share all the Team Toronto efforts, our partners intentionally promote these location-specific mobile clinics to the specific sites and communities that the clinic is meant to serve. Generally speaking, pop-up and mobile clinics are brought to the attention of eligible clients directly by primary care physicians, employers, building managers, faith leaders, and other local leaders who are directly connected with those for whom these clinics will serve. These types of mobile clinics are located in specific locations determined by the healthcare leadership table in order to expedite the provision of COVID-19 vaccine within high-risk neighbourhoods rather than attendees from outside those communities. In response to the rising COVID-19 case counts and hospital and ICU admissions, our Emergency Operations Centre is continuing to proactively manage personal protective equipment while ensuring that our incident management system continues to support both vaccine clinic operations as well as critical and essential services each day. I am pleased to report that our PPE inventory is stable and is being managed carefully each day and our incident management system continues to operate 24 hours per day in support of all frontline and vaccine clinic operations. In closing, I encourage all eligible residents to book their vaccine appointment without delay by accessing toronto.ca slash COVID-19 or by accessing the provincial call centre at 1-888-999-6488. Please do not contact 311 nor Toronto Public Health for assistance in booking your COVID-19 vaccination appointment as our staff are not able to access the COVAX system on your behalf. Finally, please continue to monitor toronto.ca slash COVID-19 for the most up-to-date information on vaccinations in Toronto. Thank you. I now invite Dr. Davila to bring her update for today. Thank you, Chief Pegg, and good afternoon. Today, I am reporting 1,296 new cases of COVID-19. There are 632 people in hospital, 108 of them are in the ICU. Sadly, we are reporting five more deaths to COVID-19. From last Thursday and through today, we have seen 6,114 new cases of COVID-19 in Toronto. These numbers speak for themselves today. I will only add that when the Hospital for Sick Children is providing ICU care to adults, you know you're living through one of the worst periods of the pandemic. The women and men in Toronto's hospitals who are somehow finding reserves of professional resolve and personal strength are truly incredible. No that your colleagues in public health are working tirelessly alongside you to prevent ongoing transmission in the community, pushing through exhaustion to address cluster and outbreak investigations, 
infection prevention and control, and vaccination rollout, to name but a few. No matter where I look, whether in public health or in health care, I see people doing heroic work under a crushing third wave of virus. What we are seeing is the explosive, exponential growth described by me and many of my peers when the variants first arrived in Toronto. The old COVID-19 virus is being bulldozed by the B117 variant, with the other two primary variants present in Toronto as well. It is much, much easier to spread a variant COVID-19 virus. So please, stay home. Every time the virus spreads from one person to another, the virus has an opportunity to mutate, even to create a new variant that could create a whole new set of problems. Please remember this. Everybody needs to do two things in the days ahead. We need to stay home and apart from each other until the tide turns, and we need to get vaccinated as soon as possible. If we mix right now, we're adding risk upon risk. If we stay apart, we will, with patience and diligence, reduce risk. If we get vaccinated as soon as our turn comes, we will reduce risk. If you have had your vaccination, continue observing the steps for self-protection to protect others. If you are amongst those waiting for your vaccination, the best thing you can do is to stay away from people you don't live with as much as you possibly can. When you can't, be outdoors as much as possible, but still be strict about the steps for self-protection. The 1918 flu pandemic was so deadly and so widespread that more than a hundred years later, we still compare it with what is happening now. But even then, the 1918 pandemic ran its course and ended. Today, we have incomparably advanced scientific and medical knowledge. We have information and ways to share it instantly. We have a world of advantages that will help bring the COVID-19 pandemic to an end. And we have ourselves able to do things in daily life to bring it to an end even faster. COVID-19 has produced one challenge after another, but we live in a time when we have never been better positioned to meet those challenges and ultimately overcome them. With that, I'll now hand it over to Lavin for the question for me. Thank you, Dr. Davila, Mayor Tori, and Chief Pegg. We'll now begin the Q&A from the media. As a reminder, it's one question, one follow-up, and when we call your name, please unmute yourself. And we do also have staff on the line if you have any technical questions. First up, we have Matt Bingley from Global. Go ahead, Matt. Hi, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, rather. Uh, Dr. Davila and I guess uh, Mayor Tory as well. Uh, earlier today, uh, Dr. Davila was presenting the modeling numbers showing uh, upwards of 2,500 daily cases due for the city at the end of the month. And I'm wondering if you think that more restrictions are needed to lower that number. You often speak about uh, learning from other jurisdictions. I'm wondering what other restrictions other jurisdictions have uh, who are facing what we're looking at with exponential growth, such as uh, curfews or something like that, maybe something that you think would help. So why don't I start off, Matt? Thanks for the question. Uh, you know, the, the, you're quite right. Uh, the information that I presented at today's Board of Health suggested that 
you know, with no change to transmission patterns that we could see as much as 2,500 cases on a daily basis uh, by the end of this month. And clearly this is a situation that we would all like to avoid. So, you know, in, in uh, keeping with what we have done throughout the entire pandemic, which is to apply the best available data and evidence to our circumstances, we're constantly talking to our provincial counterparts, as are all the other public health units around the province, uh, looking at what opportunities there are. And as I've said before, I'm in support of those solutions that can be implemented and can be made to work that actually reduce the uh, spread of COVID-19 in our community. Uh, of course, any measures that are put into place rely on each and every one of us complying with those measures. And fundamentally what it comes down to is each and every one of us keeping our distance to the greatest extent possible. And the greatest way to do that is to actually stay home as much as possible for those for whom that is an option. That's how we best protect our community and it's how we best protect all those who need to provide those essential services that allow our city to continue to function. I'll, I'll turn it over to the mayor to see if he has anything further to add. Well, I think Dr. Devella has said it very well. I will just say that uh, I would uh, obviously abide, as I have throughout the pandemic, on the advice of the public health officials led by Dr. Devella herself. Uh, I'm not a great fan of curfew, so it would take some persuasion if that was something that was to come to the fore. But I think at the end of the day, uh, what we have to do for the moment is focus on the measures we have in place. I think this week is a real moment of truth because I think we can turn the corner. Uh, and I think we can, with the vaccination efforts we're making, uh, help, uh, help ourselves turn the corner uh, in that way as well. And so I think if we focus on those things, uh, then there's, there's notwithstanding projections that come, uh, the projections are based on current circumstances. And if we can do better uh, as people collectively uh, and do better in terms of our efforts to get everybody vaccinated, then uh, I think we can do better than those projections uh, would suggest. Okay, back over to Dr. Davila. Uh, I, I was wondering if you could break down the cases that we're seeing today uh, by, by age category. I was asking uh, your counterparts with Toronto Public Health if they could do this, uh, much like Ottawa Public Health does by a 10-year age bracket, and, and was told that they can't. And I'm just wondering if if you could do that and, and going forward if you could do that. And if you think that uh, you know, where many doctors are saying that this is now shifted into a younger person's disease, if you think that this would help by showing the ages on a daily basis. So, Matt, to your question, I, I don't have those numbers available with me right now, but certainly we, we do have access to data and can look at cases by age. What I can tell you at a very high level is, is uh, you know, that what you're describing is in fact what we're seeing. We do see the, uh, you know, whereas earlier in the pandemic, we saw a, a greater uh, proportion of cases in, say, the uh, 60 plus age group. We are uh, in this particular wave seeing more and more of the cases uh, I've noted in particular in that 20 to 59 age group with a, a greater preponderance in the younger half of that demographic. We have also, as of late, seen uh, more cases uh, within the even younger than 20 years of age within that uh, school age population. But uh, I, I'm afraid I don't have those numbers with me. Happy to talk to you offline, though, Matt. Thank you, uh, Matt. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'd just like to say a word about that. You know, um, I think Toronto Public Health has done a fantastic job of making a lot of information uh, very transparently available to the public, whether it's in the releases and statements we make here, but also in, uh, in the dashboard uh, that's found on the website. But I hope people will take note of just things that I saw myself in the last 24 hours on the news. Uh, I saw a young man on television last night, 35 years old, and he's been out of hospital for some time and he's still got oxygen that he's required to have uh, because of a bout with COVID-19. And he told the story of being put into intensive care and that as he was going in, they told him perhaps he better be in touch with his relatives because his health was in such jeopardy that he better tell them that they, that might be the last chance they would have to talk. And thank God he survived. And then I heard another story of somebody relatively young who's having a double lung transplant, uh, only because I guess the person's of an age where they can do that sort of thing. But of course, we all know that there are only certain numbers of double lung transplants that are available. There are people, I guess, on the waiting list for this right now. 
And I think in some respects, maybe those kinds of things outline the danger, whatever the numbers say, that are posed to younger people as well as on a continuing basis to older people than the statistics that we could rattle off, which somehow sometimes people think, uh, you know, are, are not real or don't apply to real people, whereas the guy on TV last night and the person having the double lung transplant, those are real people and there are many, many more like them. Thank you, Mayor. Next up, we have Natalie Johnson from CTV. Go ahead, Natalie. Hi, hi everyone. My uh, first question is for Chief Pegg. Uh, Chief, I'm wondering if you can address the confusion that exists right now for people who are 18 to 49 who live in a designated hotspot and who have been told by the province that they are eligible for a shot, but who can't, as you say, book an appointment to add a city clinic at this point. Is the issue that there isn't enough vaccine for everyone who has been prioritized by the province uh, or simply that the provincial software hasn't been updated yet for these people to book when do you expect this to change because as you know the mobile clinics and, and pop-ups that are operating right now are, are not able to support that entire demographic sure good afternoon natalie the i appreciate that there is some there is some confusion and i think that we all appreciate how quickly these things are moving and how quickly we're all having to respond and uh, pivot, if you will, to the, the changes that are being made. The eligibility that the province extended to those uh, between 18 and 49 years old was and is limited to taking part in uh, mobile and pop-up clinics that are launched specifically in high-risk neighbourhoods. The, the province did not make um, vaccine available by other means, including through city-operated vaccine clinics to that age category yet. We know that at, uh, in due course and at some point, hopefully in the near future, that will change. But as it is right now, those 18 years of age and older who are eligible for, for vaccine are eligible in hotspot neighborhoods at such time as there are pop-up or mobile clinics launched. Those clinics, like we talked about, are coordinated through the Ontario uh, Healthcare Leadership Table uh, in response to COVID-19 and are operated uh, by our hospital and our uh, Ontario health teams. So uh, they are active now, they are in communities, and uh, will continue to be. Vaccine, of course, uh, continues to be, um, I would say, our global challenge. We, we all wish there was a larger supply of vaccine. I, I'm confident that, that the day is coming when we're going to see those, uh, those vaccine avail the vaccine availability increase, and that will do a couple of things. It will allow uh, our city-operated clinics to increase capacity. It will allow our Team Toronto partners to increase their capacity, and that will include uh, a wider distribution and a more frequent distribution of both mobile and pop-up clinics. But until such time as we're in that place, uh, the, the regulations or the, not I shouldn't say regulations, the um, eligibility that the province has put in place for 18 plus is restricted to mobile and pop-up clinics in those priority neighbourhoods. May I just add a comment uh, related to the meeting that was held today before you ask your second question. Uh, the mayors and chairs from the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area met today and one of the points and requests they made was for the province to perhaps uh, set out those kinds of parameters within which people are eligible for vaccine at different ages and so on on a region-wide basis so that it's clear to everybody uh, because the, there's so many different governments and public health agencies and others hospitals involved in delivering all of this that there's un, uh, been some understandable uh, lack of clarity sometimes in people's minds and so we requested today that they should perhaps set this out as part of a, a publicity campaign that could make it clearer to people uh, what some of those parameters are as was well explained by the chief and what some of the reasons were so that people will uh, better understand that and we think that's very important to the maintenance of public confidence and just to people's understanding. Uh, thanks. So my second question is for Dr. Davila. Uh, how close is Toronto Public Health to having mobile vaccination clinics at workplaces? Un uh, union leaders at Canada Post um, at the plant on Eastern Avenue, which is currently an outbreak and has lost one staff member to COVID, are calling for their workers to have access to vaccines at work. Is this something that can be done and is it too late once a plant is already experiencing an outbreak? So thanks for the question, Natalie. So a couple of things. One, uh, Toronto Public Health, uh, along with our city partners, is working on establishing mobile clinics, and those should be up and, and running uh, within a matter of a few short days, uh, as long as all goes well. Of course, there's been a great deal of emphasis. We've just opened up the full slate of mass immunization clinics, and that certainly was a, 
a heavy and an important lift, and we can now uh, provide some resourcing towards mobile and pop-up clinics. I would say that uh, mobile clinics are, are being provided largely through our Ontario health partners and our hospital and healthcare partners. And one of the things that we have undertaken together as part of the Toronto Health Sector Table is to uh, focus on some pilots within workplaces. But I would further say this. Uh, you've heard about some of the endeavors uh, and you've heard the, the mayor's remarks today around how we are focusing vaccination efforts in concert with the provincial plan on certain hotspot areas within our city where we know a goodly proportion of our essential workers actually live. And the extension of eligibility, at least in mobile and pop-up clinics in many of those neighbourhoods, goes down to 18 years of age. So uh, through the combination of the many efforts that are underway, we uh, aim to get to essential workers and their families and households such that we can uh, best address the spread of COVID-19 both in workplaces and in those communities that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Thank you, Natalie. Next up, we have John Chidley Hill from the Canadian Press. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my first question is uh, for Dr. Devella, and it's something of a follow-up to Natalie's question. Uh, Chief Pegg earlier outlined how education workers in Toronto's hotspot communities can get vaccinated. But I was curious, has there been any consideration for mobile pop-up clinics, maybe at schools where teachers and other school staff can go and get vaccinated uh, and get this done during spring break uh, when they have time to be out of school and maybe have the time to get those vaccinations done? So thanks, John, for the question. At this point in time, uh, we are focusing our efforts on the, mo the mass immunization clinics, the nine uh, clinics that we've got at the city uh, that are operating in, in various neighbourhoods around the city, and, and we've uh, situated those to be as accessible as possible. Uh, of course, um, you know, open to considering what other opportunities that there are uh, in terms of getting vaccine out to various populations. And as we uh, get our mobile clinics up and running in concert with those that are being already operated by our health sector partners, I think we're open to considering all sorts of possibilities. Again, within keeping with the resources that we have and of course, in keeping with the available vaccine supply. So options are always on the table. Uh, we'll have to assess, you know, what kind of uptake we get under our current vaccine offering and, and then make decisions as we always have throughout the course of this pandemic in concert with the data and the evidence that are in front of us. Thanks. And I have a follow up uh, for you, Dr. Devilla. The province's decision to uh, switch to online learning once spring break is over. I'm curious, what kind of impact can that have in Toronto, especially in Toronto's hotspot neighbourhoods, in terms of slowing the spread of COVID-19 and variants of concern? Well, I think fundamentally, uh, our ability to control the spread of COVID-19 and to control transmission rests in all of our hands. Uh, you know, that's what it comes down to. Uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, the more we can actually stay at home and keep our distance for now until such time as we are able to uh, improve and, and get vaccination out there into as many arms as is possible, uh, you know, that's actually what is needed in order to control the, the spread of COVID-19 in our community. Uh, to the extent that uh, schools are, are uh, moving to an online kind of environment, I, I mean, I think you've heard uh, many experts uh, opine on this and, and indicate that there is some risk of transmission associated with, with schools. Um, just every time people are out and about, there is always increased of COVID-19 transmission or increased risk, I should say, of COVID-19 transmission, particularly when we're talking about variants of concern, uh, which have demonstrated an increased uh, transmissibility relative to the previous variants of COVID-19 or the previous versions of COVID-19 that we were used to seeing in our community. So at the end of the day, it comes down to reducing interactions, in-person interactions, especially close ones, uh, in order to bring that transmission down. 
and we will rely um, to a great extent on vaccine to help prevent future waves of COVID-19 activity in our community. Thank you, John. Next up, we have Jennifer Pegliero from the Toronto Star. Go ahead. Thanks, Lavin. Hey, everyone. Uh, my first question is for Dr. Davila and Mayor Tory. Just based on some of the comments that Premier Ford mentioned earlier, when he was asked whether uh, you know something had gone wrong here, and Davila, Dr. Davila, you said yourself you uh, saw this uh, wave coming when you looked at some of the concerns around the variants. And when he was asked that question, Premier Ford referred back to you yourself, the other medical officer of health, Mayor Tory and the other mayors as, as going along with the province's plan. And I think people really deserve to know right now whether you think there do need to be more restrictions as Matt asked you earlier. I, I appreciate that you are in conversation with the province about that, but I do think that the residents of Toronto should know whether you think we're currently doing enough. So thanks, Jennifer. Um, what can I say but that we have always provided advice that is consistent with, consistent with the best available data and evidence on the subject of COVID-19. And, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, what we're trying to do is really reduce risk associated with COVID-19, while, of course, at the same time, uh, balancing this with other health risks that are out there. We know that there are mental health risks uh, and uh, isolation risks uh, that have existed and that have emerged as a result of the pandemic. So all the way through the pandemic, and you've heard me say this on many occasions, it has been striking the right balance or, or seeking to strike the right balance uh, in concert with the data and evidence that are available to us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in response to the earlier question, you know, I'm in support of measures that can be made to work reasonably on the ground that actually facilitate our ability to reduce transmission. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that there is... Um, anything uh, you know uh, worth mentioning now I, I don't really think it's a good idea to engage in policy discussions you know through the media I would like to respect the process and please rest assured that there is lots of conversation ongoing uh, between ourselves and other public health units in the province looking at what available evidence there is looking what at what impact our current set of measures are having uh, hopefully moving uh, the transmission uh, of COVID-19 in the right direction, reducing transmission as much as possible in our community, and of course getting vaccine out there and into arms, uh, and especially those that are at the highest risk and are most vulnerable and have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 uh, over the course of the pandemic. I'll turn it over to the Mayor if he has uh, anything else to add. Well, I would just like to say that uh First of all, um, I do think we should focus now at this point in time on the measures that we have in place and making sure that we comply with those, all of us, to the best uh, extent that we possibly can. Uh, secondly, I would say that without exception, uh, during this pandemic and the entire year-long period when the Medical Officer of Health and her team have come forward to me uh, with advice with respect to what should be done. I've asked lots of questions. I often put those questions of balance on the table, not that they don't, but I probe those questions to make sure that we're taking everything into account that we should, but without exception, uh, I have uh, followed and supported that advice. In fact, the only time I think we've had any um, small inkling of, of, a, of a different opinion on anything was on the timing uh, of the uh, school closure. And when it was explained to me the urgency of that situation in terms of the really very deep concern that existed about health, uh, the concern that I had, which was valid as well, about uh, notice uh, given to parents, um, I was willing to ha unfortunately place that as secondary to good health. And so I will just say that if uh, recommendations are made to me uh, with respect to other measures that are going to keep people healthier and get this pandemic over with faster, um, and uh, in that way that we've tried to take different things into account, uh, different uh, circumstances, um, I will um, continue to abide by that advice because it's, I think, the best advice we can get. And just Dr. DeVille, to go back to the 18-plus uh, situation, I agree with my colleagues uh, and with what Mayor Tory said that I don't think it was uh, necessarily communicated by the province in a, in a clear way to begin with. But I thought I heard you say at the Board of Health that you would like to see the provincial booking system opened up to the 18 to 49 range and please correct me if i'm wrong but if, if that hasn't uh been happening i'm wondering if you have any insight as to what the holdup is 
So, uh, Jen, you're, you're quite right. I, I did uh, comment on uh, wanting to make vaccination available to as broad a swath of the population as is possible, particularly in those neighbourhoods that are highest risk and highest priority based on the incidence of COVID-19 in those communities, the rate of hospitalization, the rate of mortality associated with COVID-19, and some other uh, factors that, that also line up with each of these uh, indicators whether we're looking at income levels or uh, the proportion of housing that is overcrowded in some of these neighbourhoods. Really what we want to do is make sure that we're providing every opportunity as soon as possible for COVID-19 vaccination to these hard-hit neighbourhoods because it protects the individuals there and by extension it better protects the entire city from the negative impacts associated with COVID-19. Uh, you know, it's not clear to me, uh, you know, on what basis decisions might be made, uh, you know, by the provincial government or what constraints they might be working under. But I can assure you that we are having conversations all the time with our provincial counterparts on the uh, COVID-19 response, including the rollout of vaccination on a regular basis. So I look forward to having ongoing and productive conversations uh, with the province on how we actually uh, more effectively roll out vaccine as quickly as possible so that we can, uh, you know, put this pandemic behind us. Thanks, Jennifer. Next up, we have Francine Copen from the Toronto Star. Go ahead. Oh, hi. I think my first question is for Dr. DeBella. Um, Dr. DeBella, I think a lot of people are asking today how we ended up here in a third wave that's worse than the first wave and worse than the second wave. Um, isn't there something that we could have done to have avoided ending up in this place? Uh, you know, Francine, I, I think that's a question that we may have to reflect on for some time. I don't know that we will have answers to it directly. Uh, I think you've heard the mayor comment on, you know, we know what we can do now. Uh, and that's uh, uh, certainly um, to reduce our interactions to the greatest extent possible. We know that distance does make a difference and of course we know that vaccine is another key component uh, of the tools that we have at our disposal. I, I think the other thing of course that we have to keep in mind is that um, you know the, the variants are, uh, they're a different virus. Uh, it is a different set of circumstances that we're dealing with here. Uh, so again in, in, in keeping with that, uh, I will continue to provide advice uh, based on the best available data and evidence that we see in front of us. Uh, that's what I've endeavoured to do throughout the entire course of the pandemic. I will continue to do that on the go forward basis and that's why I call upon the residents of Toronto to really do the best they can to uh, maintain distance, distance and distance as much as possible. Stay home as much as possible at this point in time because we know that actually does make a difference in terms of transmission, even when it comes to these more transmissible variants of concern. Again, the second point, of course, will be around getting vaccine as soon as your turn comes up. As soon as you, it's, it's, uh, you are eligible to receive vaccine, I would encourage residents of Toronto to get that vaccine um, so that we can uh, you know, ensure that we're deploying all the tools available to us in terms of uh, our ability to reduce COVID-19 transmission and to get to the other side of this pandemic and to prevent future waves. My, my second question is a bit of a technical question. I'm not sure if it's better than answered by Dr. Davila or uh, Chief Pegg, but people in their 50s and 60s, unless they're in hotspots, are still only allowed to access one vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine. And I'm wondering when is that likely to change? When, is, um, when are the other vaccines going to be made available to people in these age groups? When is it gonna be possible for them to book an appointment at one of the mass immunization clinics, for example? Uh, so these are decisions that are going to rest in the hands of our provincial counterparts. But let's make sure that we have, uh, you know, all the facts uh, appropriately lined up. We know that uh, certainly um, for, for residents throughout the city of Toronto, 60 plus, uh, it, or they're eligible. Those age 60 years of age and older are eligible to receive vaccine. We know that uh, those who are aged 55 years of age and older are eligible to receive uh, AstraZeneca vaccine 
through participating pharmacies and through uh, participating primary care practices as well. And Francine, as you rightfully pointed out, uh, in hotspot areas, uh, we know that uh, those who are 50 years of age and older can also uh, participate in, in vaccine clinics, uh, whether they're mass immunization clinics or others. Uh, so that's currently the state uh, of affairs right now. There are also other eligibility criteria that are out there. Uh, the, uh, the province entered into phase two of its vaccine prioritization framework. This has opened up the opportunity for those who have chronic conditions, uh, chronic health conditions, and they are risk ranked, if you will, by the province uh, to also participate in vaccine. Uh, in addition, um, some primary caregivers uh, for these individuals are also included. Uh, lots of detail here that I won't be able to describe in, in, in uh, you know, great depth uh, over the course of, of a question and answer period such as this, but I would encourage people to, to visit toronto.ca slash COVID-19 or to visit the provincial website to see all the different criteria. Uh, we're in constant communication with our provincial counterparts, certainly seeking to influence um, the decisions that are being taken. And I can assure you that we are all committed and all interested in making sure that we're vaccinating uh, as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, uh, but focused first and foremost on those um, vaccinating those individuals in those neighborhoods where we can get the greatest value uh, in terms of protecting our entire community um, out of the resources that we have available to us right now. Can I just make a comment as well on that? I think it just bears repeating what the Greater Toronto and Hamilton Area Mayors talked about this afternoon. You know, I envisage one of these ads, whether it appears online or appears in a, a newspaper that says, if you are this old and you have this characteristic, if you are this old and you have this characteristic, but it sets out for each of the different categories. And, and we think that it is best done by the province simply because they have the ability to uh, transcend beyond the boundaries. We're all regional and municipal governments and have we have some, uh, you know, tweaks involved in different kinds of clinics and other things, but the province can set out those, uh, um, those uh, guidelines, those parameters uh, quite easily and I think when they're explained they're actually fairly straightforward but rarely do we hear them set out in that way where it sort of speaks to each group and you can go down the list as we would do many times when we look at advertisements or checklists and find the group that we belong to. So I think that is something that would be very helpful at this stage. Thank you Francine. Next up we have Malia Sheik from City News. Go ahead. Good afternoon. So I had a question for Mayor Tory. Uh, Kingston Police put out a news release recently saying that parks are not to be used as a destination or for activities like sitting or sunbathing, which is not allowed under the stay at home order because it doesn't qualify as exercise. So they attempted to enforce this several times at Breakwater Park on April 8th and the park is now closed. So my question is, will Toronto enforcement be taking a similar approach and are people not allowed to hang out in parks for fresh air? Well, of course, uh, people are supposed to go outside and engage in safe, healthy activity. And uh, some of this comes down to a question of interpretation, which is sometimes in the hands of enforcement people and other times just in the hands of people looking at uh, what the rules are. Um, and uh, in, in that regard, one of the things we're thinking of doing is to, you know, repaint uh, some of the circles in parks to help people with the distancing because, you know, that's sometimes a challenge on a nice day. But um, I can just tell you that the enforcement people were out uh, this past weekend as they'll be out going forward and, and, and Chief Pegg or others uh, on the line may wish to say a word about that. But that, um, you know, the the um, approach will be to, as we have done, encourage people if they possibly can, while not saying they should not use parks. I think what we said was, you know, go for a walk in, in your own neighborhood. Don't travel to a destination park, if I can call it that. Um, try to stay in your own local area. And of course, try to stay with your own family, the people that you live with, uh, the pe in particular, the people you live with, as a means of the distance and uh, requirements with public health uh, guidance that uh, Dr. Davila and, and others, uh, all of us have been referring to today. Leah, in uh, Chief Peg, in response or just in follow-up, <coughs> excuse me, to Mayor Tory, our coordinated enforcement team was very active over the course of the weekend, both proactively, so engaged in the community, proactively inspecting and engaging with folks, as well as uh, reactively in the sense of responding to complaints. I can tell you that over the course of the weekend, uh, there were 10 charges laid by our, by our enforcement teams under the Reopening Ontario Act and a further six notices were issued. And that includes, uh, that's a net sum of 
um, issues re relating to businesses, to Ill uh, illegal gatherings, as you described, to parks, uh, and a number of different types of complaints. So uh, as you've seen in the past, and like we talked about uh, last week, the, the strategy, if you will, for our coordinated enforcement action has not changed. Our teams are still directly connected, working both proactively and then working together to uh, receive complaints, to prioritize them and triage them, and to respond to on the basis of the, the highest risk complaints first. Follow-up? You'll just have to unmute yourself. I had another question. There's also a couple of gyms that are sending out letters to uh, their clients, uh, telling them if they get a note saying that they have a physical or mental disability and that they need to work out, uh, that they bring that note, and some of them are trying to open up, such as F45, a couple of other gyms. So is the city looking into this? So, Amalia, thanks. That's actually the first I've heard of this. Uh, you know, I'm certainly happy to have uh, our team work with others in enforcement. This is a, a question, I think, for, for legal counsel to understand, uh, you know, what opportunities there are in the regulations. But as far as I understand it, and again, uh, this is the interpretation of legal uh, or legislation and regulations uh, by a physician, which is perhaps not the best thing to do. But my understanding is, is that uh, there, there aren't those exceptions uh, or opportunities for s such exemptions under the existing le legislation and, and associated regulations. But certainly happy to take that offline and, and take a look at uh, what the specifics are. Malia, I'll just say that I too am unaware of the circumstance or the example you gave. And as Dr. Davila indicated, uh, we'll certainly take that offline. I'll connect directly with Carlton Grant, who leads our municipal licensing and standards team, as well as uh, Toronto Police and our legal, our legal branch to understand uh, exactly what is going there. So thank you for making us aware of that. Thank you. And then last question is Momen Qureshi from 680. Go ahead, Momen. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. Mayor Tory. this one is for you. Councillor Matlow is bringing forward a motion calling for uh, the city to allow uh, people to able uh, to consume alcohol in public parks and uh, beaches, uh, citing that with the weather warming up and that's going into our second summer of this pandemic, there are people who don't have backyards or balconies where they can do that type of thing. Uh, so my question to you is, is it time for the city to em embrace that and uh, allow people to drink alcohol in public spaces like parks and beaches? I've been, uh, you know, positively disposed toward, towards some sort of review of this for some time, for a couple of years now, and I think this kind of thing was obviously interrupted by the pandemic and, and our focus, our need to focus on the pandemic exclusively. I think when it's done, it should be done thoughtfully and carefully. Uh, because I think there are many different aspects, including public health aspects and including uh, just, you know, the, the, the sort of well-being of people when they're in parks and the general enjoyment of parks by everybody. And so I think it'll be something uh, whose time will come, uh, you know, perhaps uh, shortly. But at the moment, my focus, my exclusive focus is on the pandemic and on uh, dealing uh, with that and trying to put that behind us so that we can all get back to being in the parks, uh, let alone what we do when we get there. Well, he wants uh, it to be a pilot project that begins in May, citing the pandemic as part of the reason that it's needed because people need a place to go. And if they can't do it, if they don't have a backyard or a balcony, uh, they need it to they need a place to go. So do you think it's something that should start that soon by May? I, I'd like to, again, uh, deal with this kind of thing thoughtfully and carefully. But I think that, um, you know, the real issue isn't for with people who have a glass of wine or a glass of beer or, or beer. Uh, in uh, a park right now. I think you'd find most of the time uh, that uh, the enforcement officers of all kinds have other things to do than to focus on that. I think the real issue is people carrying substantial quantities of alcohol into parks, and I've seen it with my own eyes. Cases of beer, cases, plural, piled up, that people carry into the parks, and I think, you know, that is something that um, dealing with that um, has to be done hand in hand with dealing with the other issue of, of uh, making perhaps more liberal the rules related to a small quantity of alcohol and so that's why i think it has to be done thoughtfully and carefully and uh, that is uh, you know that that's how it should be done and as i say in the meantime i'm, I'm staying very focused on the pandemic and on dealing with the huge uh, challenges that we have in front of us in that regard thank you moment that's the last question for day for today thanks everybody for joining us our next covid19 media briefing will be on wednesday april 14th have a great day